There is a growing debate within the gaming community that PlayStation's exclusive titles, chiefly their first-party titles, are becoming increasingly too similar to one another and that the public is getting tired of a so-called Sony formula. Just like any properly held argument or debate, we need to solidify a definition of what exactly constitutes the Sony formula, or at least what the community has loosely agreed upon. Most people would agree that PlayStation's titles place an emphasis on strong narratives, high production values, and overall being a cinematic experience, but others claim that the result is a myriad of titles that feel far too analogous to one another. I find the argument and definition to be entirely ill-fitting and disingenuous, as the barometer is entirely too loose to be of any practical use. As you'll soon find out, this loose definition is actually far less helpful than you would imagine, and that this growing perception doesn't lie in reality as strongly as many may believe. Instead, the best way of disabusing ourselves of this notion is to simply analyze the last 10 years or so of PlayStation's exclusive output and see how applicable this formula actually is. To do this, we're going to be testing the genres, narrative, gameplay, and structure to see how similar these titles truly are. It is my firm belief that the perceived Sony formula is radically blown out of proportion, and that the three tenets of narrative, production values, and cinematic journeys aren't the end-all be-all of what a game ultimately is. While many of Sony's titles uphold the three acknowledged pillars, they still manage to be entirely distinct experiences. And just as a disclaimer, we're predominantly just going to be talking about the bigger, more recent first party titles. This video would be entirely too long if we investigated every single second party game. The obvious place to start with this is The Last of Us, which is PlayStation's single biggest new IP in the last 10 years. While Naughty Dog's previous Uncharted entries laid the foundation, The Last of Us is what cemented the gold standard of what games should strive for, and still serves as the tentpole example of the Sony formula. The narrative is fully seamless, regardless if it unfolds within player-controlled moments or in cutscenes. At times, this feels like one of the first instances that a game fully took its story and presentation completely seriously. There's a reason why Sony titles are labeled as the HBO releases of games. They just have that level of storytelling quality. But to delve a bit deeper, the core of The Last of Us' gameplay experience revolves around action combat with both melee and ranged encounters, as well as utilizing improvised weapons. There's also exploration and survival horror elements, such as zombie-like creatures and limited resources. This is all packaged within an expertly paced linear adventure that never allows itself to lose momentum. And without getting into the nitty gritty details of its plot, The Last of Us 2 is indisputably one of the most risky narratives ever etched into a massive budget AAA title. There's nothing safe about its inciting incident or plot twists. And I can guarantee that The Last of Us 2's big plot twist would have been universally praised if it was inside an indie game. Moving on to the nearest comparison in many people's eyes, 2018's God of War takes direct inspiration from The Last of Us's approach to storytelling, with one of the common points of contention being Kratos having a son that accompanies you throughout the title, a clear echo to Joel and Ellie from The Last of Us. People have chastised Sony for churning out titles in the sad dad genre, but this is such a blatantly disingenuous criticism simply by the pure fact that this is only reflective of two of PlayStation's IP, not the library at large. And even outside of that reality, the relationship between the two father figures and their companions in their respective titles is fundamentally different with vastly disparate motivations. The newer God of War titles are action brawler RPGs set within semi-open world hubs while also having linear sections and puzzle segments. The gameplay experience is absolutely nothing like The Last of Us. To claim these titles are similar just because they have good storytelling methods is just absurd. Insomniac Spider-Man titles are set within a fully open world interpretation of New York City and revolve around frantic melee combat. They also come with some of the best told Spider-Man stories of any medium. As you can already see by going down the list, these games don't play anything like one another. Does the barometer for these games feeling too similar really just come down to having high quality storytelling? It's 
getting a bit ridiculous. We'd be remiss to forget about Insomniac's long-running Ratchet and Clank series, and its latest entry, Rift Apart, is a beautiful blend of over-the-top wacky gun combat and platforming set across multiple open hub planets with an insane amount of variety. Its story is a relatively light-hearted affair with a consistently humorous tone reminiscent of a Saturday morning cartoon. I fundamentally don't understand the wide dismissal that the Horizon series has garnered within the gaming conversation over the last year. While it's true that out of all of Sony's exclusives, Horizon was the first one reminiscent of the standard open world structure, the actual world and gameplay couldn't possibly be further from generic. Horizon's massive post-apocalypse environment isn't one of brown and gray desolate landscapes, but one filled with lush environments and robotic creatures. The world is completely engrossing with a rich narrative constantly piquing your interest to discover what exactly happened. The aforementioned robots make for entirely unique combat encounters, and your efforts against them will see you utilizing an entire arsenal of distinct weapons to take advantage of weaknesses and pinpoint chinks in their armor. Nothing else in Sony's catalog, let alone most games, plays anything like Horizon. Ghost of Tsushima is the perfect realization of what Assassin's Creed should have become years ago. It's a beautifully told revenge tale in an open world filled with combat that flows seamlessly through stealth, ranged, and melee abilities. Little Big Planet and its latest spin-off, Sackboy's Big Adventure, are cutesy kid-friendly level-based platformers that allow for in-depth player creation. A narrative is present, but nowhere near the driving appeal of the package. Media Molecule's other title, Dreams, takes the seed that Little Big Planet sowed and blooms it to its ultimate conclusion into one of the most fulfilled community creation-led releases ever made. You can make entire games within Dreams, and the limits are nearly endless. Returnal follows Housemark's strength of creating chaotic arcade experiences, albeit this time in a roguelike package with a third-person shooter perspective. While the story is present, it mostly manifests in the form of vague clues that the player will have to piece together on their own. It's far from the presentation style of A Last of Us or God of War. One of the PS5's biggest surprise hits was the bundled Astro's Playroom, a tech demo for the DualSense controller turned into a full-fledged game. There's not much of a narrative present, but Astro never fails to provide a nostalgia-driven level platformer that anybody can enjoy. Naughty Dog's Uncharted series is what really got the ball rolling for the current era of quality that Sony exclusives now exist in. These are narrative-heavy games accompanied by insane Hollywood-level action and a tightly-paced linear adventure that will see Nathan Drake platform and shoot his way through a ludo-narrative dissonance level of bad guys. Being from the same studio as The Last of Us, you'll feel Naughty Dog's familiar strings at work, but the tonal and gameplay experiences present in each series couldn't possibly be further apart from one another. Destruction All-Stars is a throwback title to Sony's Twisted Metal series, albeit with a focus on multiplayer instead of a story. That said, it's still home to the underserved car combat genre that has remained dormant for far too long. Japan Studios' Gravity Rush was a breath of fresh air for the open world genre, as the core mechanic of changing what direction gravity shifted towards allowed you to essentially fly through entire cities with ease. Its narrative unfolds in an anime-esque fashion complete with comic panels, and your growing arsenal of melee and range attacks created a distinct addition for Sony's exclusive library. It's just a shame that the series has remained dormant since 2017. Long before Insomniac Spider-Man games appeared on the market, Sucker Punch's infamous titles were the definitive superhero experience. The expansive power set that only continued to grow between titles allowed players to wreak havoc throughout each game's unique setting. Combine that with morality choices dictating what direction the story unfolded in, and you were met with a journey that nothing else on the market provided. The Last Guardian is an emotionally driven puzzle game that stands distinct amongst most games available. Guerrilla Games' now dormant series Killzone, was a long stay for the platform holder. Its position as a planned Halo killer never came close to fruition, but its slower-paced first-person combat still managed to find a niche amongst the shooter market. It's also emblematic of Sony willing to concede their losses in markets that they simply aren't excelling in, and I wouldn't expect them to walk away from Horizon in favor of revisiting Killzone. Knack is a 3D platformer aimed towards kids. 
I don't have much else to say about it. The Order 1866 was a linear third person shooter directly aimed at being as cinematic as possible. I'm honestly not a fan of racing games, but it should be pretty apparent how Gran Turismo sets itself apart from everything else on the list. I'm not going to bother mentioning every single second party exclusive game, because trust me, there's a whole lot, but these in particular are worth mentioning since they would appear to fit the alleged formula the best. Quantic Dream's trilogy of games, those being Heavy Rain, Beyond Two Souls, and Detroit Become Human, are easily the most narrative driven of anything on the list, with gameplay only really manifesting in quick time events or making choices. Both Final Fantasy VII Remake and XVI are story driven titles but have just as much action combat to back them up. Kojima's Death Stranding places a strong emphasis on being a cinematic narrative experience, albeit between massive chunks of walking around delivering packages. If it sounds like I'm continually providing less and less detail on each title, it's because having to prove that something doesn't exist is an exhaustive effort. The onus of claiming that a three-line Sony formula is present lies in the hands of the proclaimers. I don't understand how you could look at this list of titles and proclaim that they all feel the same. If there's a singular publisher out there that you could claim that has their biggest titles feel entirely too similar to one another, it would be Ubisoft. Whether it's Assassin's Creed, Watch Dogs, Far Cry, or the newer Ghost Recon games, these titles are all open world experiences with the same open world trappings and objectives. While there's different gameplay mechanics at play in each title, these are simply just different verbs to achieve the same goal. The Ubisoft formula is a well-worn trend that's been blatantly apparent for over a decade. I wouldn't be doing my due diligence if I didn't mention Nintendo games. For the most part, it's the same old IPs having been recycled for over 30 years. And there's innovation here and there, especially with titles such as Breath of the Wild, but you're kidding yourself if you generally believe Nintendo is the bastion of innovation across their IP. They haven't drastically evolved, and you're basically getting the same recycled material in more refined forms. Am I chastising Nintendo for this? No, but I'm just trying to assess why people have a double standard. While Microsoft has amassed an impressive arsenal of studios for future exclusives, the fact remains that Sony had carefully cultivated its studios for 29 years, with studios such as Naughty Dog and Insomniac long being second parties before being acquired. Microsoft, on the other hand, has consistently fumbled its most important franchises such as Halo, Fable, and Gears. Although, I personally love the last two Gears games and tactics, but they could be so much bigger than what they are currently. Xbox's one solution is to pull out Microsoft's wallet and buy companies. And to paraphrase an episode of Sacred Symbols, Microsoft is fundamentally not a creative company. Sony, on the other hand, foundationally understands how to foster their studios. Even Hi-Fi Rush, Microsoft's best game in over 10 years, was in development long before Xbox acquired Bethesda. Microsoft's handoff approach can be great for studios, but it's a double-edged sword and reveals that they don't know how to lead teams. So why is the bar so high for Sony? We could just chalk it up to fanboyism or mimetics, but it's a bit too prevalent in gaming podcast circles to entirely dismiss outright. People that chastise Sony for making third-person games make absolutely no sense to me. How can you outright dismiss one of, if not the most prevalent, camera perspective in gaming? Sony tried doing two series of shooters back in the PS3 era and dropped them after seeing that the market was flooded. Should they abandon their expertise purely because it uses the most common perspective? So why is this thought so common? Is it some form of counterculture? Is it due to an overinflation of marketing annoying people? I'm not sure. All in all, I think the argument is completely overblown. But what do you think?